Hello, I'm Arturs, and uh, this is my presentation, The Politics of Architecture. So comparing and talking about the indescribable influence politics has on architecture around us has been my passion for a very long time now, and I believe it is quite interesting to discuss. I seem to have noticed that many people actually don't realize the huge impact architecture holds. It deeply affects the way we travel, the way we spend our money, the way we perceive beauty, and, well, the way that we live. It practically dictates the everyday life of you and everyone you know. While that may be difficult to comprehend, the politics behind said architecture, well, that's a whole another deal. I've also only chosen to talk about examples from Latvia, which will surely hit closer to home. Without further ado, let's dive right into the thing. So to begin with, I would like to talk a little bit about the footprints of ideological architecture. I'm sure all of us, or at least most of you here, are familiar with what that means. Different political ideas and powers have dramatically molded our streets, our homes, and our lives. But for many of these forces, it was important to create a mark, leave a footprint on the soil. Something carved out in stone could be the very literal, cornerstone of a government, it could represent values and ideas, and it could represent human life or loss of it thereof, and yet it was nothing but a piece of rocks or metal when we look at it now. For example, the Russian Tsar Peter II was once where our monument of freedom stands today, but nowadays, well, it's been shut away from the eyes of the public, not found on any tourist sites, lying there in an old shabby yard somewhere in the eastern part of Teika neighborhood awaiting rare visitors to stumble upon it. And yet, politics are driven by these abstract stone formations, as many parties base their agendas appealing to the same values some of these buildings represent. Another typical characteristic of governments, especially non-democratic governments, is to get rid of anything that opposes them, essentially destruction of the old. For Latvian dictator Carlos Ullmanis, architecture-wise, it meant to obliterate practically all of old Riga and instead build a new capital city, one that would be more of Latvian taste. But how could such term even exist? How can a building be representative of an ethnicity? This is a solid example of how politics tried to change our beauty standards. Luckily enough, though, this plan of his never happened, for better or worse. Moving on to how politics has shaped our dwellings, the places we live in. And, well, this is going to be personal, but when I came to Riga State Gymnasium number 3, and both teachers and class asked me where I'm from, I said, I'm from Marupe. And then I was immediately considered rich for some reason. It didn't matter, though, that many of my classmates themselves lived in exclusive locations, new projects, even old Riga or wherever, but some of them probably had never even been to where I'm from, but they knew something about the place. So this is a story about stereotypes as well as municipalities and local governments. When someone says they're from Riga, you don't immediately see them as rich really, but why? After all, Riga is the wealthiest and most populous municipality in Latvia. So why? And perhaps you guessed it, but the answer once again here is politics. That's what really determines everything. And because if Marupa had been part of Riga, it is very likely it would nowadays be treated as any other rural part of the city, distant from the prosperous downtown and irrelevant whatsoever. Because as the city policy states, roads and infrastructure are primarily built where a higher amount of population would benefit from it. In the suburban town of Marpe, there are around 11,000 inhabitants. That's six times smaller than the biggest neighborhood in Riga, Burtsiems, which would definitely be prioritized in any city policy. Without the good roads and infrastructure, just the bland lanes of housing, would Marupa really be much different from its more modest neighbors, Pierino Radgazene? And since I mentioned Purtsiams, let's look at some of the absurdities of Soviet city planning. Not to mention the fact that typical housing was built mostly using the cheapest materials and building options. The biggest aspect that was disregarded was the human, the inhabitant, the little man lost in these endless blocks of functionalist concrete jungle. The yards between the houses lacked public space and quite honestly look like trash. I mean, <laughs> the apartments are crammed on top of each other and everyone is stuck closely together. Housing made for sole existence, not living. Have we learned from these mistakes though? Are we different today? And when you ask yourself, well, why do we live like this? 
The answer, once again, is the brutal politics behind this architecture, the pol political plans and ideas that disregarded the human life. And this brings us to the final segment, which is about street architecture and economy. Well, while at first glance it may seem like these pictures were taken in the Netherlands, perhaps, the more hawk-eyed of you may easily recognize that these pictures are actually from the town of Aadeshi, when street reconstruction works happened last year. This truly European standard street um, has bike lanes separated from car traffic as well as pedestrians. The needs of every participant of traffic, traffic have been thoroughly considered, and this street isn't from a lovely village in Germany, but in fact, the main pedestrian street in Daugopils. Sure, it may have cost more than if the municipality had simply decided to renovate the street by just fixing the asphalt layer, but instead they decided to make an investment that will surely pay off as people would actually want to spend time here, and are much more likely to visit the local stores and shops rather than just view the street as a connection between one place and another. And that is the difference in city planning and management many still struggle to see. And it all comes down to political will, whether the people in power are ready to make a difference or not. To conclude and wrap this up, it doesn't always have to be the Netherlands, Germany, or Switzerland. We can have nice things too. And to those who say, why would we need bike lanes? Nobody uses bikes. The only logical answer is because our current architecture dictates we shouldn't. But perhaps if we had bike lanes, more people would start using the bike. Is it, it is up to nobody but us to choose what kind of city do we want to live in, what kind of streets we want to walk, what our neighborhoods will look like, will we repeat the mistakes of people before us, will we shape architecture or will architecture shape us? So vote. Vote for a greener, cleaner and more people-friendly environments. Vote for a smarter and thorough city planning. And maybe one day we will live in a city like this. Thank you.